All right, guys. Well, uh, I'm still recovering. I actually came home from work and ended up taking like a nap. But um, man, what a great weekend. Uh, what I went to was the 2017 Baltimore Comic Con. It ran from September 22nd to 24th. I was there for the days of the 23rd and the 24th. Um, still haven't got my computer to, you know, fixed, but you know, I've been on the road, been working and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, I had a great time. So first and foremost, Charlton 66. All right, Northern Monkey here. What's up, brother? Uh, but first and foremost, Charlton 66. Steve, okay, go sub the guy. He's fantastic. I was uh, kind of wondering how to... Uh, all right, Louie's here. Thanks, man. Uh, go subscribe to Louie, too. Um, but uh, And I did this early because it's very late for him. But anyway, getting back to Charlton 66. Uh, turned around... Um, we're on Spider. What's up, brother? We'll just take a minute to see who's popping in. What's up, guys? Yeah, we're on Spider. It's been quite a while, man. Quite a while. Okay, but uh, Charlton 66. Steve, while I was driving today, you know, he, I told him I was going to do a haul video and did a few things with him. And uh, on his channel, we did like a real short recap. And when I got home, I saw how he was, uh, he'd already done his haul video. And uh, turned around and uh, was thinking about, you know, I don't want to gush on the guy too much, you know, but good God, the understatement of the year is that Steve treated me like a king up there, okay? Guys, I'm having, apparently, uh, everybody's getting home from work and the bandwidth is getting used around town, so if the quality goes down, you know, yell at me there and I'll kind of pause a little bit so you can hear me. But uh, Steve Ogden, man, uh, treated me like a king up there. He is a fantastic guy to hang out with, fantastic guy to go to cons with. Uh, I met his wife and his brother and stuff. Uh, Steve, thank you. Everybody go sub Charlton 66, man. Um, cannot begin to describe what a good time we had. Um, ended up getting eight hours sleep uh, pretty much through the whole weekend until I got home Sunday night. Uh, was juiced up on B12 vitamins on my drive up to Baltimore. Uh, got there, was excited to meet Steve, a little excited about the con the next day. And then we also, during that day, met uh, Matt Comic Quarter, uh, go sub him, and Tom Ryan, met him. And the joke that we have going on is that, uh, you know, you know, Charlton66 and I both know what those two guys look like. Real great guys. Um, on Sunday, Tom Ryan was just there on Saturday, short talk, we took some pictures for us. And then on Sunday, uh, we got to the con. Uh, they let the VIPs in at 9.30 and a few other people. And I'm not sure, but I think we were only there like about 20 minutes. Fire alarm went off, and we all had to go outside of the place. Met up with Comic Quarter again, Charleston 66. And we went and ate Subway uh, breakfast sandwiches while we, you know, waiting for everybody to let us in. Didn't lose too much time, but it was fantastic. Getting a good breakfast before starting that. You know, the miles are getting to me. It's not the years, it's the miles when I start taking care of myself. All right, now, I'm going to show off the haul, maybe answer a few questions, talk about things. I did it this way because of a lot of stuff, right? But but the first thing I want to show is when I was telling you about um, Charleston 66 treating me like a king. Um, at Heroes Con a few months ago, I got a great deal on Epic Illustrated. I've had some various issues and, and things like that. But I talk about heavy metal, like when I was a kid and the influence it had on me. Well... Going into the 80s, Epic Illustrated is that book that when I read, it gives me that nostalgia, nostalgia, where I can actually smell the air, you know, as corny as that sounds, I can smell the air and feel the early 80s and stuff. And uh, the glare is on there, but Steve went through his collection while I was there and insisted on giving me Epic Illustrated number 26. Yes, so underrated, isn't that? That's right, Word on Spider. Amazing Muffinator is here also. So Steve went through this and insisted on giving this to me, and I just couldn't I, uh, thank you, just thank you and stuff, right? Uh, so this this is this I may have the complete uh, Last Galactus story by John Byrne that started in, in this issue in October of 1984. So it's October, so um, August. This came out the in August, so this came out before I went to school, and I remember reading it. And as many people, as much as I'd already seen some of John Byrne's artwork, like in uh, the early issues of Fantastic Four, before John Byrne took over the writing also in like the 200s and stuff, I'd already kind of noticed that style of artwork. But this is when I started like, um, you know, getting the paper out and started like copying 
John Byrne's version of, of uh, the future Earth, where Galactus feels he is no longer bound to, by you know his promise to Reed Richards uh, to uh, you know not eat the Earth. So he returns way in the future, and there's a mystery in the universe that he goes on. Epic Illustrated ended up ending before they ended that story. Parker Rizzo, what's up, brother? All right, God, good to see you guys, man. Okay, guys. Now, as for the haul, here's some free things they gave you. Uh, I don't know if you had to be IV. I'm pretty sure I know how you had to be VIP to get some of this stuff. I had a shirt here also, and I think I washed the thing already. But anyway, I got a free shirt for Baltimore Con. Uh, they gave out this book. I kind of chuckled because it's The Librarian. It's a TV show. I know people like it. Some people watch it and stuff. I've checked out two, three issues. But what really got me about this is I looked up there and it's Will Pfeiffer writing it. I enjoy Will Pfeiffer. He did a series. He actually has done one of the top 10 comic books in my collection that I enjoy. Hero number 11 where he took the concept of Dial H for Hero and he has a one, uh, you know, a one-shot story uh, in Hero number 11 about a caveman that gets it. Uh, so seeing Will Pfeiffer on this, I'm not joking. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to read what I have here. Uh, this is through Dynamite. And I don't know if it was a Baltimore exclusive. I don't see Baltimore on there. Yeah, it is. It's a Baltimore exclusive. There's the Baltimore Comic Con. All right. Um, another thing we got here through Aftershock Comics by Cullen Bunn. Uh, Dark Heart. Um, I'll check this out. No idea what it's about. Like I said, I, I got home last night about 10, 10.30, I think. So, uh, you know, I had to spend the day recovering. And this thing is fantastic. I watched a little bit of uh, Charlton 66 Hall, and he showed this book a little bit. But this is Mike Ringo. Well, Mike Waringo. Everybody called him Ringo. Um, Telos, okay? Mike Ringo died. I think we're coming up on nine years, if I, think, if I remember right. But this was his uh, creator-owned uh, fantasy series. And uh, a lot of the artists that were at um, at Baltimore Con uh, put in uh, artwork for this based on those characters. They do this every year with a theme. Uh, but some of the stuff uh, I'm looking at for the first time with you is amazing. Love this stuff. Absolutely love this stuff. That is fantastic. Let's see what else we got here. A few black and white. Look at this. Look at these two pages. That is beautiful. All right, moving on there. Oh, man, some good stuff. Got so much stuff. Uh, the other thing, it looks really nice, dude. Jealous. Northern Monkey. <laughs> um, I was going to move on from that. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm too tired to have witty jokes yet. So they'll come. They'll come, right? Another thing, there's this artist that is there in the back of Baltimore Con. As you go, you know, you walk through the vendors and you go around the other artists and stuff. And you get in the back and it's like Indie Island is what I think they call. <laughs> Thanks, Northern Monkey. They, uh, as they, uh, you go back there, you know, and it's the, uh, it's the, st I hate to say, but it's, it's like the starving artist. You know what I mean? Back there trying to break into comics, got their own little self-published books, however they got there and things. But there are some artists. And as uh, Charleston 66, his brother and I were kind of walking through there, there's this new trend going on. And I've noticed it with Fred Hembeck on eBay. You know, his are a little bit bigger than this. And around the, around other places and stuff. Uh, and I saw one guy get one from Paris Collins, but... They go out and you can buy these little Bristol boards that are the size of these little trading cards. You can get them at Hobby Lobby and stuff. I've seen them. And apparently, now you can get original art on these and be able to store them easy. And this one artist, his name was Rich Sensel, S-E-N-S-A-L. He's out of uh, Belmore, New York and stuff. He had a whole bunch of them. He also had of these little cards that he drew of different heroes, and he also had some sketch covers that were fantastic, of like Swamp Thing, and quite a few of them were already sold. But this guy was a genius, and what he did is that he took two cards and made them where they connect for Rick and Morty. And as I was sitting there just kind of thinking about it and kind of like listening to the guy tell me he'd give me a bargain on them, Charlton 66 says, I got you, Tim, and he got them. So that means that these are going to go into my, right here they are, into my season one and two of uh, Rick and Morty DVDs. So again, thank you Charleston 66. I love Rick and Morty. I would love to just do a whole live show with some people who like it and just talk about the show. That would be fantastic. Such a smart show. Now moving on to some of the books, right? So I'm just going to do the trades first here, right? As everybody knows, I'm getting closer to collecting all of the uh, service issues at least from 24 25 all the way to 300 
And at the same time, I'm doing my best to kind of get these trades that came out. There's 16 trades, you know, at bargain prices. I need to get on watching that show. Yeah, uh, Warzone Spider and Rick and Morty, I think it's freaking genius. Let's start with season one and go on. My favorite one is Rick Potion number nine, I think is what it was called. Uh, that's the one to me where that show found its voice and wow, wow. Uh, moving on here, I found these two for $5 at the con, right? I got, uh, like I said, there's 16. Pickle Rick, yes, Lou, Pickle Rick. Oh my God, that's an episode from season three that is just fantastic. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about Rick and Morty so bad. Uh, that was the episode where I thought they finally did an episode where it was going to be predictable and then about five or six minutes into it. No, no. I'll check it out. Yeah, that'd be cool, man. Um, so moving on here, we got, uh, this is volume 14, Foreman Boy. Wubba dub 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 dub. Northern Monkey, my Rick and Morty people. We are out there. That is awesome. Uh, Foreman Void, and then I got Last Days, uh, 16, this is the last volume. Um, so I have quite a bit of these volumes, two for $5. I got Church and State, uh, two for $4.99 on eBay. Uh, a couple years ago, over the last two years, I've gotten a few of them for $3 at Heroes Con. So I'm getting all of, I'm getting these, uh, so far, uh, all except for the first volume, I paid uh, five or five or under $5 for each volume when you do the math. So that what a way to way to go. Found this in a dollar bin, right? From Hell, number six. Alan Moore's uh, story where he researched uh, Jack the Ripper forever and came up with who he thought uh, was Jack the Ripper, right? I think this was a 12 issue series. This is volume six, first print. Found it in a dollar bin. I was very happy to find this stuff. Most of what I was doing at uh, Baltimore Con as I was going through there. Uh, was the, I don't know if there's anything real spectacular in the hall, but I was I'm filling in gaps. Okay, I'm not buying that many new books, so I'm taking this opportunity to do things I haven't done for years. But then again, every I have a full set of Sandman, but every now and then I'll see a beautiful copy of the early issues and said they need a home. They really need a home. And this was the time to grab Sandman. I saw one vendor that had the Doll's House. That's like issues. Um, the particular issues issues he had was like nine through like uh, 45, and then I saw all kinds of kindly ones. This is the time to jump on there, but this is issue 17, Calliope. Dream Country was a series of short stories that were Sandman related, and this one is about when you get a muse, an actual muse that inspires you and she's enslaved. And Kelly Jones came on here and did some great artwork in this. I always love those. Now, uh, at some convention, maybe last year or something like that, I found these for a dollar a piece. Well... I went to read them, and as soon as I got the first issue uh, out, I started to open it and realized this, these have never been opened. So now this is a 30-year-old book, and I found these for 50 cents a piece on Sunday, right? This is Neil Gaiman's first work. Get the glare off there. It doesn't matter. The artwork is very dark in the cover, but this is Black Orchid, one through three, prestige format. This is Neil Gaiman's first work. Uh, book one, what I showed you there was, I think it was book three. Book two, I got them out of order. Book one and uh book three uh and these are still really in good shape 50 cents a piece could not believe it all right um i left behind somebody bought them up which is no big deal i took a chance i found a great big huge run of lone wolf and cub that came out in the 80s through dark horse and they had frank miller covers on the first i don't know 10 to 12. then later on they started getting mike plug on there doing covers but it's translated comics i think from actual you know japan uh, of lone wolf and cub <clears throat> And I'm not going to comment on it because I'm still learning. Have you read American Gods? If so, is it any good? Um, I've read I've read the first issue of American Gods, and I enjoyed it. Uh, I know a lot of people that enjoy the book. I think I've read three or four chapters in the book, in a book's a million, while I was killing some time um, a couple years ago and stuff. And it's Neil Gaiman. It's Neil Gaiman. When it comes to his novels, they either keep me interested or they don't. That one kept me interested great concept uh american gods ended up uh, influencing supernatural i was the tv show but anyway back to the lone wolf and cub i didn't uh, so these were all like a dollar a piece and i was wanting to wait until a sunday this you know when you can get the uh, get the great deals and stuff but i still ended up getting a huge stack of them and uh like i said i was piecing them together uh, i got issue two with frank miller covers number nine love lone wolf and cub that's true. I for totally forgot about that. Yeah, Warzone's awesome, man. Uh, number 15. I think these are... 
Yeah, number 15. Just a great, just a, just a great series, man. Number 14. Uh, oh, number 13. A little bit out of order. Number 23. And number 22. And number 17. So, yeah, those later issues are, you know, I guess they're supposed to be hard to find with the blue covers. But somebody came in, got them. No big deal. Uh, I ran across them. I've still got a great one. I'm up to number seven with American Gods. It's pretty good. Cool. Okay, words on Spider. Northern Monkey says it's good. I have the first issue over here somewhere. Oh, guys. Give it just a second. Should have got something to drink before this. All right, I had a bad connection. Can you guys hear me? Did I get took off? Okay, we're going to go through and just pretend that uh, I'm still working here. Okay. And then I found these for 50 cents a piece. I ended up getting two number ones. I've had this series twice, and I keep selling it. Then I keep regretting. And I go back and get it. So, uh, I'm okay. Thanks, Louie. All right, so I got Batman the Cult from the 80s. Prestige format. This is uh, Jim Starlin and Bernie Wrightston. Um, so, uh, this is I, had, I found for 50 cents a piece. I have two number ones in fantastic shape. And I got book four. All right, so, you know, I'll find the other two. I may have them upstairs already. Uh, so, but yeah, a little Bernie Wrightston for you doing some Batman. Jim Starlin doing that little dark take on there. Uh, what was it? Is it a, a Preacher Thorn or something in there? Yeah, I'll just go back and read it. Okay, now we're going to go do some Marvel stuff, some Marvel books. What do you think about comics going... Oh, well, we're just going to ignore that one. Okay, guys. Number two, here's a uh, ARG. Uh, I got this mainly for the cover. I may already have it. I think these were 50 cents a piece. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, either a dollar or 50 cents a piece. About everything I have is a dollar or 50 cents a piece. All right. But his ARG from the Bronze Age of Marvel. And this thing has just amazed me how great of shape this, this copy actually is. It may be reprints, but that cover with the Universal Monsters. Uh, when it comes to Bronze Age, I just love the freaking horror books, man. Here's some Mike Plug, I believe. Yeah, it's a Plug cover, at least, of Man-Thing number 11. A beautiful copy. I'm actually really close to getting almost all of the Mike Plug um, books that I want. Uh, Marvel Team Up, number 26, Spider-Man and the Frankenstein Monster. I'm getting these things all day long with him. Uh, number 12, Love Marvel Horror Books. Awesome. Uh, number 12, I do too, man. That is the Uncanny Kyle Waka. Uh, number 11, going back to, uh, you know, big beast coming at him with fire. Just fantastic stuff. Number three, cannot believe I found this for a buck. Uh, Blank Plug, uh, this may be an upgrade if I've, I think I already have it. Beard Window 07. <laughs> Off the cuff, but I watched the documentary Road Trip Mobius. Crap. Well, that'll pop back up in a minute. I'm getting some comments. It's taking a minute. Now, this was something that I'm very lucky to have found. They had a Marvel Super Special with Labyrinth back in the day. And what they did with those Super Specials, when Marvel uh, did an adaptation of the, of the actual films, they would take that Super Special, which was the complete movie, and then break them up in either two or three-part stories. I have number one upstairs. But this was David Bowie fans trying to get this. This is Labyrinth fans trying to get this. And then comic book fans wanting this if they were into it. So this, when they broke this up into a three-part miniseries, this book, I've seen it go for $120, $156. I've seen one, two, and three each go for $30 a piece. So I found some beat up, read my lips, beat up copies of two and three that I'm fine to get. Now, I love my Bowie. And when I was like uh, 13 or 14 when this came out, why did I not pick up this miniseries? Because New Universe was starting. I wanted all those Marvel number ones of the New Universe. Talk about messing up. But look at that number three. Look at that. <laughs> Davis Comic Finds. All right. Yeah, um, you're about to go off there, but whoever's talking about Mobius uh, being a genius and stuff, he is there. All right, we got Labyrinth. So I have the three issue set of Labyrinth, and I'm fine with it. Uh, what do we have here? Number two. Okay, these I have one, two, and six of Warren Ellis's Moon Knight. Has come highly recommended by several of my friends. Uh, Tim Anderson being the big one. So now I have number two, a first print. I got uh, at a flea market, Hillsville Flea Market, I got one through five. But one and two ended up being second prints. So for a buck a piece, I ended up finding number one and two first prints. The red bar indicates the first print. 
uh, second prints have a blue bar. So I have number one and I finally have number six. So I have all six issues of the Warren Ellis uh, Moon Knight. I have read one issue. All right, Louis is telling me also one by one through six of Ellis's run on Moon Knight was brilliant. So it's good to know that Marvel had something come out in the last year or two that was worth reading. It was fantastic. And like I said, I'm piecing this. I would love to have, I bought this Marvel uh, Comics Presents off the racks when they came out weekly, okay? And I was able to get the entire run of um, Barry Windsor Smith doing Weapon X, which was the origin of pretty much watching Wolverine get his adamantium every week. Oh, bad connection again. We'll just move on. Okay, so basically, World of Ellis is a boss. That's right, Northern Monkey. So we turned around, and over the years, I kept those, and they got beat up because I actually read them. Barry Windsor Smith reached a point where it was just fascinating to read everything. Somewhere on the line, I don't know, I think I sold them to my brother because he was piecing together Marvel Comics Presents, so I sold him things. And I've replaced the set one other time, sold it. I had the hardback Weapon X uh, that Marvel came out with, sold it. So now I'm back to piecing it together. I think I just need one or two issues. Yes, well, yep. Uh, Barry Windsor Smith, uh, yeah, love him too, Words on Spider. All right, and then this is just purely for eBay. Over the last five years, or give or take, I don't know, since 2010, I've been able to piece together the 90s um, Ed McGinnis, um, Joe Casey run. I think it's Joe Casey. Joe Kelly, excuse me, Joe Kelly. I was able to piece together this uh, run for, seriously, about a dollar a piece on two different occasions. And less than that, the first time I did it, this entire run. I've had the entire run twice, sold it, went, and then uh, pieced together a few more here and there, sold it. So now I'm starting all over again. I just pick up Deadpool, collect them. Uh, take that money and, and buy comics with it and stuff. Um, I'm, I'm, I've lucked up. I'm not a huge Deadpool nut. Love the movie. I can chuckle a little bit. I keep Deadpool number 11. That's the one issue that I keep. Uh, so, yeah, starting all over again. Found that for a buck. All right. Have I shown all this? Yes. Okay, moving on, guys. Now we're into some of the DC stuff. I'm coming back, I promise. Okay, the DC stuff. This might get better as it goes along, okay? Uh, Garth Ennis, uh, there, he has a book called Hitman that I really, really like. It was 60, 60 issues. Davis Comics Finds, not a Deadpool fan. He does the same. Oh, awesome. Okay, cool, man. Um, Section 8. This was a six-issue miniseries that was an offshoot of Hitman. This is in Gotham City and Hitman... Uh, had some heroes that came around to a bar that were just jokes. Garth Ennis doesn't like superheroes because this is so this is poking some fun at it. Section eight is the actual team. There's like dog welder. There's a dude who actually welds dogs to people. And then you had six pack here who's basically a drunk that'll like just, you know, he'll grab a beer bottle and take it to you and come at you to knife you with it. So I, these are, I needed the first two issues, and uh, apparently in each issue he's uh, just uh, going after, you know, driving another member of the Justice League crazy. And I ended up double dipping, but these were 50 cents a piece in number five. Um, I think Garth Ennis has a very dark and twisted sense of humor. I met the guy. It's funny. I love it. And then a uh, few books. I'm starting to have some fun again. I'm starting just to have some fun with it. A little nostalgia, a little bit, uh, especially when you find these books for 50 cents a piece. I have a full run of Captain Carrick to begin with, but I'll buy number one all day long, you know, just for the fun of it. This is like maybe my third number one. And at Heroes Con, I met Scott Shaw, who drew, who did this with Roy Thomas. Uh, turned around, I lose the viewers every time I show a cartoon book. It's how funny. But anyway, I met him, and this is just a fun book. This is fantastic. Earth Sea, if you will. Uh, here's a book. I, need, I think I have another issue of this I need to check. But after Captain Carrot was... Uh, Captain Carrington's Amazing Zoo Crew, mind you, was uh, uh, canceled. They came out with uh, a little three-issue miniseries called The Oz Wonderland War. And I'm not joking. I don't know what it is about this book, about these three issues. Maybe it's the Oz connection and the Wonderland connection and stuff, right? But this is actually sort of hard to find in the wild in my experience. You know, this kind of cracks me up. Just something that's unique and fun. And I'll get through these real quick, but I'm going to do it. I saw, I, I passed up Starhawks, and I wish I didn't, but I'm sure I'll run across it again. But I'm going to start going to get the number ones of all these toy books. Here's Centurions. I mean, I'm an 80s kid. I have two childhoods. J. 
just talked with Arthur Adams, and what do you where, where do I rank uh, Arthur Adams uh, as an artist? Um, oh, he's 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 a legend. He's a classic. That man is still evolving his artwork. He he's doing a lot of commissions. Uh, he's able to draw the perfect monsters. Uh, he's self taught. Um, I see a lot of Mike Golden in his work. Seriously, uh, I don't know if that's true or not. That was his influence. But when it comes to Arthur Adams, man, he, he's solid. He's slow, but, um, you know, when his artwork came out in the 80s, he was put on annuals and specials and, and things like that, and his long shot work. Um, yeah, get, uh, solid, solid and fantastic. Uh, Arthur Adams is really one of those guys that I'll turn around and grab anything he does. I have his monkey man in O'Brien. Um, he's got some backup stuff in Tomorrow's Stories that he's doing with Johnny Thunder. Or Johnny Future, excuse me, Johnny Future. So many Johnnies in comic books. Anyway, here's uh, Centurions, number one. All these toys. Now, my toys were G.I. Joe and uh, Masters of the Universe, okay? Then Humanoids. And it drives one of my friends crazy, Tim Anderson. It drives him crazy, but believe it or not, I was more of a GoBots guy than a Transformers guy. I mean, I love my Transformers, but, I mean, let's face it, you know, we were poor. So... When you're a poor kid, you would see your friends uh, Transformers and play with them, man. But, you know, you go to Kmart and get you a GoBot. I actually have a GoBot or two still around here. In Humanoids, and then uh, one that I loved. And I actually, like, outgrew it pretty quick with its little motors and stuff. Micronauts guy, all right. Uh, robotics, number one. And I still have the little uh, astronaut, if you will, that came with this set. I'd rank art items higher as an illustrator than as a cartoonist. Okay, well played, Jared Osborne. Okay, I could see that. Yeah. He's done a, there's a commission piece that, uh, I don't know if it went actual viral a few weeks ago, but I think it was Fantastic Four number 100. And what he did is that he re, he was commissioned to do it, but he like, he took star, Starios, all right, <laughs> Knights of Olds on here, all right, awesome, man. But he like took Fantastic Four 100, like and it had all these characters on it, and he kept the little box that had the Fantastic Four heads in there and things like that. So he took that and then he drew, he expanded the Fantastic Four piece around it, drawing even more Fantastic Four characters that showed up in the first 100 issues. He apparently disappeared in his bedroom, his drawing room for almost a week and his wife would just go check on him. He does women perfect. Art Adams draws women perfect. Um, I, I can see that. I can see that. All right, moving on off the hall, this is my third copy of this, which is fantastic because it took me so long to find this book at a decent price or to find it at all. But uh, I'll grab it every time I get. I now have a, I have a, you know, I have a UPC symboled one, which was, you know, I'm going blank on the words, but it was not direct market. It was on the stands, and this one is a direct market edition. But this is Tales of the Teen Titans number uh, two. This was a four-issue miniseries that came out around 1982, I think, where uh, George Perez, Marvel Wolfman, and maybe some uh, other artists would tell the origins of the four members of the uh, Teen Titans. And Ravens, Ravens seems to be the big one. Like I said, not a pricey book. I've seen I've seen this book sell for a little bit and stuff, but I grab it every chance I get now just because it took me so long to find it. One of those books where I kept an eye out, but it's just fantastic. George Perez, just a fun book. And I know it's not showing up, but uh, it amazes me how the the newsstand edition seems to be have a the the blue is not as dark. The the colors are more rich on this one on the direct edition. Mm, something to ponder. Put that to the side. Okay, now living by myself, every now and then I'll be like having a run. I have comic book database on on uh, the internet, so I can keep track of my books and stuff. And every now and then, I'll find out one is missing. And this is one of the books that just disappeared. I live by myself. I can't see somebody going through my collection just to steal that one book. Perez and Wolfman or Byrne and Claremont. Uh, when those Tales in the Teen Titans came out, everybody bought them multiples even. They must have been really high print runs. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Now, I was like nine years old when that came out. Uh, but that's what I'm saying. I remember everybody being nuts about it. Now, when it comes to Byrne and Claremont versus Wolfman and Perez, that's real tricky. Uh, that's not just a simple answer of me saying, I, you know, I personally go Wolfman Perez, but when it comes to Claremont and Byrne, it, to a certain extent, the way it looks as a fan, Wolf, Marvel Wolfman made George Perez a better artist because he told him his, when they first were working together, and I think Marvel Wolfman was his editor or something, he told him his, 
his ability to draw perspective sucked. So George Perez got a book on perspective and then he came up with this amazing white tiger piece that made history in the Bronze Age, right? But those two consider each other friends and everything like that. I've talked to Marv Wolfman and while I was in line to meet George Perez and, and things like that. So I got a little history. Those two guys are friends. So they enriched each other and made each other better. And Marv Wolfman encouraged George Perez to be you know, a writer when he did Wonder Woman. Then you have Byrne and Claremont, who I don't know if they had a personal relationship or not, but you know all the you know fighting they did that came out about the uh, the fate of Jean Grey. But I'm gonna go with Byrne and Perez because like they just have such a history of stuff. They were together longer than Claremont and Byrne. The Claremont and Byrne stuff was just in freaking inspiring. But yeah, let me get off on that. But anyway, number forty one of Tales of the Teen Titans. I now have everything I need of this series uh, to have a complete Teen Titans run. Uh, I need number two, of course. That's a pipe dream. That's the first Prince of Deathstroke. I don't ever expect to get that. So now I have the volume one that came out in 1980, or actually technically volume two or three or something. But anyway, so I have that. And then uh, I just really want like maybe the first hundred issues of the Baxter series and stuff. And I'm getting close on that. But as you can see here, I got number 27, which is a wheel and a way down on it. Now, I could have gotten more issues but I wanted to move through the con. I didn't want to get stuck looking up on my phone and going through the Legion of Superheroes and Titans and stuff, right? Now, I don't know if anybody knows the significance of this, but there was two of them, and I should have got them both, but I bought this for two bucks. I just went ahead and did the two bucks. Uh, this is DC Comics Presents number 51, Superman and the Atom. But what's even more significant about it is that this is the second appearance of the Masters of the Universe in comics. This is a preview of the miniseries that was coming out. So if you're a fan of the Masters of the Universe and the toys and stuff like that, here's your preview. DC Comics Presents number 51. I had this one as a kid and it just disintegrated over the years into nothing. Cannot believe I found this as a number one. This is another one of those books I will pick up every freaking time I see it, man. Okay, Superman Annual number 11 for the man who has everything. Alan Moore and uh, Dave Gibbons. Uh, just a classic Superman story about the Black Mercy and you know, uh, making Superman, you know, uh, puts it, it's leeching off of Superman and puts him in a dream state of like he never left Krypton and he has a son. A uh, great story. And I told, yeah, the first appearance of Master Universe is pricey. I have it. I actually found it in a dollar bin, a dollar bin, a dollar box at a flea market a couple years ago. And that's a book. Missed the last one. But this thing was in fantastic shape. The, I've probably had like three or four of these now. The last one I bought, someone had put, you could tell they put tracing paper over it because there was indentions all over the, th over the characters where you could actually put your finger in there. Hey, look, yeah, yeah. That's good. This is great Gibbons work in this and stuff, right? But this thing was like mint. So I got this thing in a bag first thing for a buck. I have no idea if it's still worth anything, man, but it's fantastic. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm plugging in holes, plugging in runs, completing sets, and I have no idea if I have this or not, but the Batman 1 million, I'm really close to having all the 1 million books if I don't already have them. Uh, I'm sure there's something, I'm, there's two books I'm definitely missing, but this is Batman 1 million, so I grabbed that. It's Batman, always cool, can't have enough. And then the 1 million, uh, 1 million the, the 1 million was an event in the late 90s by Grant Morrison, where DC Comics said, when would the one millionth issue of all our comics come out if it really happened? And they came up with the 853rd century or something. So they made an event where the Justice League of the Future came back and there's a whole Grant Morrison story there. So they gave us the one millionth issue of these books, the crossover. And then you get to Our Man. There was three part, three part story that tied into one million. Our Man, I don't know anybody that's a fan of this book. I don't know anybody that's got a run of this book. Uh, he was in the Justice Society. That's how I have him. But apparently um, in issue 11, 12, because this is 13, uh, you can't find these. Uh, so I found number three. At least I haven't been able to. So now I need uh, the first three parts. Our Man, one million. This is three of three of a three-part story. I need one and two. So that's just closer to get. Dollar Box. Found this for a dollar. I'll grab these all day long. Mr. Miracle number three. Um, very. It, this thing has some ticks on it and some color breaks and issues, but it's stapled. Still has a little bit of gloss on it. Um, I'll grab these all day long just to have readers copy. You know, uh, get Kirby goodness. Found a hundred page giant of Shazam. 
Uh, again, a little bit beat up. I mean, it's a dollar, a dollar, but I have the 100 page Giants of Shazam upstairs, but coverless. So yeah, I have a cover. Uh, just fantastic stuff. I'll, I will buy these all day long, all day long. All right, filling in some gaps here. These have straight Gary Lytle covers. Uh, they came out with a mini series called Legends of Legion, and I think it was four parts. Yeah, three or four. And it's each issue took a little moment to take a, a popular Legionnaire if you're into the Legion. Or, and just kind of show where they came from and give them an origin. This one has Starboy, and we have Umbra, who is actually Shadowlass. Is Blade Runner 2 going to suck? Um, <laughs> I hope it's not. I'm gone, I'm starting to go into movies, with, and I've been pleasantly surprised with quite a few like It. But, uh, you know, the, the way Hollywood, Hollywood, like I listen, listen to me, but the way, you know, the way these movies have come out through remakes and stuff, some of them are just irrelevant and forgotten about, like the Total Recall remake, or there was no purpose for them, didn't move the story forward. Uh, Blade Runner that's coming out, that's coming in, what I'm doing is I'm going into these movies, if I go to the movies at all, to watch them. Uh, with very low expectations, and for some reason when I do that, I come out liking it. I don't think it's going to suck. I'm just going to, it's going to be interesting to see if they get that Ridley Scott feel. Odds of any movie being good or long. That's what Jared Osborne said. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, it was actually good. The Stephen King It was good. And I heard horrible things about The Dark Tower. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a crap shot. You know, we all know that. But uh, I don't know personally if it's going to suck or not. But the fact that it has Ryan Gosling in it, I'm like, okay, at least it's not Marky Mark. You know, I'm like, it could have been worse. Yeah. Um, Hellblazer. Oh, and by the way, Blade Runner is actually one of my favorite movies. At night, to help me go to sleep, I play the Blade Runner soundtrack. I have the laser disc of Blade Runner. Laser disc from the 90s of Blade Runner right there. It's sitting... I'll get it. Yeah. And up here in this shelf, I have the sequel to Blade Runner in novel form and stuff. So here's your laser disc of Blade Runner. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm a fan. Okay, where were we before I got all movie-fied there? Now, I can't believe I found these for at least a dollar. These are very early issues of John Constantine El Hellblazer. Yeah, Lou, uh, Blade Runner to me is right up there. I, I can think of three movies that have the best soundtracks ever, and Blade Runner is one of them. Lost like tears in the rain. I've seen sea beams over the horizons of Orion. Yeah. Okay. What the name of the book sequel to Blade Runner? Um, oh man, you're gonna have to Google it, man. You have to Google it, man. As you can see, I've been like rearranging my books, and it is somewhere in this mess. And right here, you see this cloth up there. Um, that's it's it's somewhere in this mess, man. But you can Google it easily. The you know just the Blade Runner novels. Uh, sorry, man. Um, okay. But anyway, Hellblazer number 20. Some great Jamie Delano haunting stories in here. My favorite issue of Hellblazer, of, the, of this run at DC before it became Vertigo the first time around, is number 11 called Newcastle. Uh, that's my favorite issue story of, yeah. Blade Runner, which do you like better, narrated version or no narration? Funny enough, this was a thing. No problem, we'll Google it. Okay, we're going to get off the hall here a little bit here. Stuff. We're, we're talking Blade Runner. I'm down. Jared Osborne asked, do I like the narrated version or no narration, right? I grew up, and I have the VHS upstairs, I grew up with the narrated version. Had no idea that there was a problem with it. I like film noir. Film noir. I love film noir. You know, I, uh, starting all the way back, you know, with Maltese Falcon for me. And uh, the long, the oh my God. Watch me go blank now. We're switching from comics to movies. My brain's going to have to adjust here, man. But The Long Good Night and uh, Highway 44. I'm probably butchering these titles, man. But I have like about 12 film noir movies that I freaking love. So when the movie came out, I loved the narrated part of it. And then I saw the final director's cut with Ridley Scott and it just blown me away, right? If I'm really in the mood to really just sit down and watch an actual film, I'm going to go no narration. Yeah, I, I, I still watch the narrated part every now and then. I love, because it, it gives it a film noir uh, feel to it. It turns it into a, like a detective story is what it starts feeling like, you know. But without the narration, you have a solid, you know, hardcore sci-fi movie. 
The Edge of Heaven, maybe. Yes, yes, that's a great one. Ready Player One looks way cool. Yeah, I'm, and I think Hannah, something about Harley Quinn there. Didn't get to see that last comment about Harley Quinn. Yeah, it's, uh, holy cow, that Ready Player One. I don't care if that movie bombs or not. I'm buying it just for the Easter egg hunting in that. It has the freaking Iron Giant in it, people. I think Hannah looks like Harley Quinn in the scene where she is with the toys. Yeah, yeah. It's called Blade Runner 2, The Edge of Human, if anyone wants to know. That's it. Uh, I'll tell you who said that in a minute. So whoever asked about the Blade Runner novel sequel, Blade Runner 2, Edge of uh, Human. And, and I, I enjoyed the book. So uh, Jared Osborne, long way, still way going. I want to say no narration, but I, I still watch the narrated one also. Okay. Number 15 of Hellblazer. <laughs> Moving on with the comics, you know. <laughs> Number 44, the last uh, part four of the Bad Habits Garth Ennis story. Um, I don't know how it was back in the day, no internet and stuff like that, but this was actually where I think John Constantine went from having a cult following. Detective 29, how funny. Detective 29 is the one that figured it out. Okay, Jared Parker's talking to you. All right. But uh, this is where I think Hellblazer got elevated to like almost mainstream status a little bit in the comic books there. All right, then number four for a dollar. Number four. Number ten. And now I'm going to show you something here where we're going to play a little bit of a guessing game. All right, this is Legion of Superheroes, number 38, titled The End, right? Hard book to come by. This is Captain Adam, number 42. Captain Adam, number 42, a little bit of a hard book to find, okay? The, the significance of these books on how they're connected is that these are two appearances by Neil Gaiman's death from the Sandman series, right? And this is the one that started the whole, I don't know if it's an urban legend or not, but I think it is an urban legend that Neil Gaiman got really mad that somebody at DC used his version of death without asking him in the main DC universe before they went, you know, vertigo. And then this one is uh, Death is Used as a Way of the Earth Blows Up, finally in the future in Legion of Superheroes. And there's this fantastic uh, little prose section where you just get this picture of uh, Neil Gaiman's death, uh, about as big as a sun, and all of the surviving cities of Earth have all kind of clustered together in order to survive. So these are death appearances. I just picked it up. I'm going to try it out since you worked at Marvel. Curious where you rank Miller's run on Daredevil. Look out, Jared. They're coming for you, man. They're coming for you. Okay. And then I found this. This is uh, number two of three of a death of uh, the high cost of living. I mean, I'll pick these up if they're cheap and stuff, but I didn't realize it was ripped. And then uh, number one of the series. This is probably I have four of these. I uh, absolutely love these Neil Gaiman stories, as you can tell. Okay, guys. Oh, number 20. All right. Anybody got any more movie questions? That was kind of fun. Blade Runner, Rick and Morty, I'm so down for this stuff, right? Okay, then this is part two of a part of a two-part story. Okay, they're talking out there. Yeah, this is the Silver Agent, right? From 1932 to 1973 to our eternal shame. Silver Agent was um, had a few early appearances in uh, Astro City, kind of like in flashback, or you'd hear a character talk about the Silver Agent. And Astro City takes place in real time. Of course, Silver Agent is symbolic of the Silver Age. You know, he was active from 1958 to 1973, and it seems like the, the Thing, 1980s version. Yeah, I love the Thing. I love the, I'll get on that in a minute there, man. Uh, but this was a big mystery for people who followed Astro City. When do we want to get the story? And uh, so finally it came out, but it came out like, I don't know, 10 years ago, and I could never find part two. So I finally found part two. It finally says how, what the world did to the silver agent that made them have shame, you know. And knowing those, you know, how the end of the silver age and stuff, it's going to be something, I have a few guesses, you know. Okay, so while I was walking around, I ran into this writer. Um, I forgot what the movie was. I just found out there are two Blade Runner books called Replicant Night uh, and Talon that came out in the 90s. Haller, have you seen Miller lately? He looks kind of sickly. I wonder if he is okay. Okay, um, at Baltimore Comic Con, Frank Miller there was on Friday. I was not there Friday. Uh, Saturday, I was a little bit loopy and kind of out of it from the driving and not sleeping. But as I wandered around the con and stuff, I picked up on some conversations and actually was in a few places where I asked people that were they able to see him and stuff. And 
Uh, they said he was like he's at death's doorstep. I mean, one guy person actually said it looks like his face was just kind of going to the left or something, you know. So it's a big mystery. Uh, Charlton 66 and I kind of talked about it, you know, while we were driving around and stuff, what's going on with him. I've heard everything from he was like, he was a bad alcoholic and came off of it, and that's what it did to him, to where he has cancer. There's a lot of things going on that's that's being said about it, and I, I kind of respect the guy's privacy in a way. I would love to know, but the fact that it hasn't been put out to us, what's wrong with him? But I did see Rob Liefeld come to his defense when Frank Miller released uh, a picture of Superman for the Master Race, Dark Knight 3. Of all people, Rob Liefeld said that after how he had seen uh, Frank Miller a year ago, we should be grateful that he can even pick up a pencil and draw. So whatever happened to him apparently had people thinking, going by that information, that he'd never draw again. I don't know. It was amazing. Astor City and the Connected Books are fantastic stories that departure from your form Formula Hero story. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So as I was walking around the con, a uh, Boom Studios booth caught my eye, and I looked down, and I have ordered uh, the Power of the Dark Crystal uh, series that's out now. I think it's going, it's going to be 12 issues. And actually, I ended up talking to the person who wrote issue three or four, I think. And he, I think Philip Kennedy Johnson is his name. So I don't know if he was being serious or not. I don't see why you make up something like this, but he asked about my accent. I'm in Baltimore. You hear how I talk. Uh, he noticed my accent is a very sounds very Appalachian. I said, "Yeah." Well, he said he was from Kentucky, and he held up a, a trade of Warriors of the Appalachia. I told him I would check it out since he writes Dark Crystal, or worked on it at least, or whatever he did. Um, so I found these in the fifty cent bins, number three and four, and I think it was just a mini series to begin with. I don't know, but Warriors of the Appalachia. I will check this out. Okay, and then. Uh, I've Charlton 66, Steve again, I think he rec he told me about this series a while back. I'm sure somebody, I think somebody might have told me after Steve. All right, but this is the image, uh, Airboy, a four-part story, okay? But Airboy is a Golden Age hero, and the only time I'd ever heard of Airboy, ever, ever had heard of Airboy was from Eclipse Comics in the 80s, right? So they turn around, and uh, what they've done is that uh, I was told this was debauchery, and having sex and drinking, and uh, we have penis in this. We have penis running down the road swinging. There's no other way I know how to say it, okay? Because that's where I stopped reading. But apparently, uh, we, we have uh, two worlds here. We have Airboy actually coming out of the comic, and he's in color, while we have these horrible tones, color tones going on, of these guys just like in a downward spiral in li life, and it's the artist and the writer. It's Robinson and the guy Hinkle, the guy writing this. And Airboy freaks them out because he comes out and he's trying to help them. And then I think he sucks them into his comic book world and we get color. So James Robinson is one of my favorite writers. He did The Golden Age. He did Starman. I'm going to give him a chance on this. So I like what I read so far. Autumn Lands number 11 by Kurt Busiak. The Commandy story that Kurt Busiak had, DC wouldn't let him have it. So he couldn't have Commandy. So he kind of molded and shaped it into Autumn Lands. Edward Scissorhands number eight. I now have all 10 or 11 issues of the story that came out. I'll probably be putting them up for sale. I was just missing an issue. One of my favorite books to read is Gone. Uh, based, this is pretty much a manga series that they bring over here. And this is finally one in color. It's usually in black and white. There is no words. It is fantastic, fantastic art in this. Telling the story of this little two, actually, I don't know, 18 inch dinosaur with a huge head that's mean as shit. And he's getting in a little adventure, swept up, fighting big animals, ended up on the back of hawks, not knowing where he's going. Will Iron Man 55 break the curse and actually retain its value? I'm going to say yes. Sounds like someone stole that idea from Wizard of Oz or Pleasantville. Eh, they might have. They might have. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about Airboy. Eh, they could have. Uh, gone. Here's Gone. Uh, I love that story, right? And I'm willing away on my service collection. Here is issue 131, a uh, missing issue of the Jaka story that I have. Dude, I, I, I think I have over 200 issues of, of service now. 157 with mothers and daughters. I, I'm not, I know it's not going to show up. That is a beautiful blue cover. I love how that, that dark indigo blue that's on this. Uh, service number 12, still floating around, being tossed around in the ether with uh, the, the doll. Guys, number 11, a fantastic cover. 
Got me some Richard Corbin Twisted Tales from PC Comics. I love these books when they come out, um, but the PC, I don't like, I can't stand how big the title is on these. I know it's probably trying to pop out and get your attention. And then uh, two issues of Strangers in Paradise. I met Terry Moore. He was fantastic. Is that the comics? Have I actually got through the comics? Okay. Sign stuff real quick. I love Twisted Tales by PC. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Joe Lunsner. I had to chase him from Charlotte to Baltimore con to get inside this. Bought a few of those when I started collecting them at 10 years old. Oh, awesome. That's Carl on ba base 181. Awesome, man. And Lisner has a very cool cover. Uh, cover. Signature. Uh, Don's eye with his signature. Very nice. Mark, make Mark Hempel, Hempel, who uh, did the kindly ones. I just had him sign the trade and got a print off of him. Uh, for my girlfriend. Uh, yeah. Mark Hempel's good stuff. That is death. If you didn't know already. Um, and then Tom Palmer. Tom Palmer is an inker, and I, it was really, it was great for me to finally get to talk to him, you know, for me, you know, and, and apparently he, he, he ended up not charging me for his signature. Um, I went through a lot of stuff because Tom Palmer is the guy. Thanks to John Bushima working on Conan, and then also reading my stepdad's uh, Dracula series that was out, and then seeing Tom Palmer come in and ink some John Bushima and Avengers somewhere or something like that. He was the one that made me stop and actually look at art and look at techniques and see the differences and really pay attention to what they were doing with art. Uh, his is uh, Tom Palmer inks or what I, I, I didn't realize at the time, but I was studying them. And we had a few back and forth talks and Tom appreciated it. And he signed, uh, you know, an issue of this, uh, where's it at? He ended up not charging me for his signature. Um, but I ended up, <laughs> I wanted him to sign this one. Uh, you know, he inked that over Lee Week's covers. But, uh, you know, we just went with the first part of the story. So, Mini Tom Palmer is really cool, man. Really cool. One of those old school guys. It's like Philip Jose Farmer. I love those guys. That This this con was really interesting, man. Because, like you see, it had, like, Paris Collins, Ron Wilson, Bart Sears, uh, Jerry Ordway, who I got to see. And a bunch of these guys. And I uh, have two childhoods. Sig signatures cost money now. Some of them do. Magic number three is great. Yeah, Magic number three is a great Tom Palmer cover. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm picturing the first issue in my head. I have the miniseries upstairs. I'll check that out. I'll check that out. I've seen some Tom Palmer painted covers. And actually, I, I think he might have done this Labyrinth number three book that I just showed. But I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to say here. I'm just off the cusp here and stuff. But this was very surreal to me because I joke around that I have two childhoods. You know, I turned seven in 1980. So I had that childhood in the 70s that I can remember, actually, believe it or not, remember very well. And then the 80s where you kind of grow up and stuff, right? So uh, seeing all these artists at once that were part of that part of my childhood and everything, it really did have a surreal moment. And so that was awesome. Uh, Tim Truman signed some uh, Jonah Hex for me from the, the, when they went vertigo. Tom Palmer is one of the best ever. He and Senate are standard. When you remember the inker in a book, you know they're good. That's Detective 29. Remember the inker on the book, you, you know they're good. Well, it's funny you say that because I just said this. I, I've told people this before. Uh, Knights of Old, I'll, I'll tell you here in a second here a little bit about that. Um, the the Saint Joe Senate I met in 2002, I think, 2002 or 2004, and he was standing beside of Nick Cardi, and I didn't realize that I was going to go all fanboy when I saw Joe Senate, you know, he's, he introduced Nick Cardi to me, and I was like, oh, nice to meet you and stuff, and I bought a print off of him, he signed something for me, Joe Senate and Tom Palmer are those two inkers that just, just were amazing to me, you know, like, I, I knew their style, like, I identify their style before I even knew their names, you know, um, you know, so, yeah. Uh, Terry Moore. Terry Moore, class act. Uh, I'll point out, somebody told me not to forget Echo. He did Echo, Rachel Rise, and, and things like that. But I got him to sign the, he signed the inside of both my, uh, you know, the first two Strangers in Paradise trades and stuff. Very nice guy. I got to talk to him. Uh, there's pictures on Twitter of some of the folks I met. And Terry Moore, I love how when he does interviews, and people ask him about his influences, he goes straight to uh, Charles Schultz, you know. Um, and his artwork is just fantastic, you know. He's a great storyteller. 
Um, nothing really to say too much about Stan Sakai. Um, I, it was, hey, Stan, you want to, uh, you care to sign some books? Well, yeah. And he signs the books. You want to take a picture? Sure. I grab some kid walking by to take a picture of us. He kind of chuckles about it. And then he sits down and I thanked him, told him I loved his, you know, loved his work. You know, I told him I got, you know, so here's you, Space Shizagi number one and number three. I was hoping to find number two, but I didn't. Uh, I took these with me and Stan Sakai signed them. Great stuff. Jerry Ordway. Holy crap. Heroes Con over the summer. You could not get near him. The line was too big. He was sketching. He was smiling. I went to a panel with he and Roy Thomas and a few other people. I listened and talked about All-Star Squadron and bitching about uh, DC Comics, uh, you know, uh, around 85 and 86 when the crisis hit and all this stuff, right? So I'm walking by and I found a window where nobody was at his table on Sunday. And I started talking to him. Some guy who worked there, he was a volunteer for the con committee and jumped in front of me and said, Captain Marvel Shazam and all this stuff. Walt Simonson stopped by the local diner to sign his Alien Artist Edition for a friend of mine's son. He's always a nice guy. I'm getting to Walter Simonson. He's the next in the list there, Jared. All right. So anyway, I took these because this was amazing. And I was going to open them up and have him sign them on the inside because I've had these forever. This is the Batman movie adaption. And if he had time, I was going to ask him, did he watch the movie in advance? How did he nail it? Because when you look at this Jerry Ordway art in here, it is the movie. It, that is Jack Nicholson. That is Michael Keaton. You know, that is, you know everybody, right? And then I just love this issue where he got to sort of revamp and, you know, come out with, you know, Shazam and stuff, right? But, you know, this guy came up there and, ah, Dr. Silver Age. What's up, brother? What's up, brother? But uh, it was a really nice time. Jerry uh, Ordway was just fantastic. I ended up getting behind the table. We got a, you know, we were talking back and forth about the Captain Marvel serial that came out in the 1940s. Uh, Uncanny, yeah, Walt Simpson's X Factor run was awesome. Uh, so Jerry Ordway, and actually, you know, he was working on a piece for somebody or doing something. He was drawing and he was working. And I actually reached a point where I got a little bit self conscious and I was like, all right, all right, I'm going to go. I mean, it was just going too well, you know. He's like, well, I'm not trying to get rid of you. Great guy. Very professional. Okay. All right, Walt Simonson. Now, I took a stack. I have a stack up here of stuff I was going to try to get him to sign. There was no getting near him on Saturday. I was able to get in line, and I think there was four people, four or five people in the line when I got there. And I'm going to give a shout-out to Avery if he watches it and makes it through this. I doubt he will. This is already on an hour, and uh, I've just got a few more things to say. Uh, but uh, there's a young man named Avery who was very nice. He turned around and looked at me said, you look familiar. I asked him if this is Walt Simonson's line. You had to see how the lines were going. Uh, Walt Simonson, I finally was going to make it. And uh, you understand, Walt Simonson has also eluded me. His lines have been too long at Heroes Con. Uh, but when I got there, Walt is freaking fantastic. He, it, it feels authentic. He's jumping around and he's joking with him. He's come on over sitting down here. He's witty. He's full of energy and all this stuff. Makes you feel nice. Yes, I'll sign this. Yeah, have a have a seat and all this stuff. Yeah, Warzone Spider Walt is worth meeting, man. So we sat there and I told him a little bit about following his work and stuff. How you know since I was a kid. And uh, he turned around and you know, he's like receptive to it. And we joked around and stuff. And you know I picked a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that I could have picked from him going back to my stepdad's books with Hercules. And he was on Thor in the 70s, you guys, you know, before he ended up taking over Thor in the 80s and writing and drawing it and, you know, uh, a few of those books and stuff and got to talk to him. And it's kind of surreal because I've ended up chasing that guy through like four or five cons. He's either had a long line or I've showed up on a Sunday and he and Wheezy were leaving or, and Walt likes to get up and walk around. So anyway, I went ahead and I went with my Elric series. I figured if I want to get something, let's go big. You know what I mean? Uh, prestige format. Um, Michael Moorcock, Elric, I have all four issues, uh, something a little bit different. I had like, I you know, I had some DC Bronze Age stuff. I had some 80s Thor stuff. Uh, I'm sure I had something else, but I was like, let's just keep it simple because I didn't want to carry this crap around all day. And Bart Sears. Walt's work first caught my eye on Metal Man in the 70s. Yes, that's what a, that's what a lot of people said. I think Charlton 66 said that also. I didn't see his Metal Men stuff until they were coming out with some book uh, called uh, The Art of Walt Simpson or something uh, through DC. And I saw Dr. Fate and Metal Men, some other stuff there. 
Uh, I remember noticing his style. I didn't know it was him when I was flipping through some of my dad's detective comics. I still have a few of them, and I saw it was Manhunter, you know. Uh, but yeah, Metal Man, it's really surprised me how many people are starting to pop up and say Metal Man's where he got him. I have one issue of his Metal Man that I, I think somebody mailed to me about two years ago. So now I have Justice League Europe, number one, signed by Bart Sears. I have Justice League, number one, signed by Kevin McGuire. You know, this was a little era of the Justice League where you loved it or hated it or you accepted it and just rolled with the punches and the jokes and stuff, right? But Bart Sears was very cool to see. I walked up. I'm very comfortable with the guy. He's very nice. He was there with his omnibus press, you know, guys and stuff. And I just, you know, he had some guys that looked like he had signed like 25 issues of Turok number one from Valiant or getting CGC. I don't know what was going on. So I was there being very patient. He just kind of kept looking and kept looking. I was just no big deal. I'm very patient. You know, it's Sunday. And then all of a sudden he comes up. He's like, hey, man, you, you want me to sign that? I said, yeah, we've had a relationship since 1987 that you don't know about. For some reason, I was able to joke with this guy just like right off the bat and he got it. You know what I mean? Um... So then I was like, do you mind to have a picture? He's like, yeah, let's get you behind the banner here. and We'll do all this stuff like that. And he stands up and he is freaking huge. Go to Twitter. Look at the picture of me and Bart Sears. He's a whole head taller than me. So after we take the picture and I'm cracking up thinking about it, I kind of looked at him. I said, you know, with me beside you, you look like one of your drawings. Yeah. <laughs> you know? he, I think back in the day, if he was in shit, you know, if he, he, I, he looked like he used to weightlift to me. I don't know. I don't know. But he's a huge, funny guy. Bart Sears is awesome. And I'm just going to get through these last two here. There's not really, I, I'm not going to say it was anticlimactic. I'm not going to say it was disappointing, but it was different. Uh, not what I expected. Ron Wilson was very, uh, probably would have signed my, you know, what if for free. Ron Wilson, one of those old school Marvel guys. Ron Wilson probably would have signed this for free, but I, I wanted to be respectful. I said, are you charging? He was like, three. Came up with the number and kind of looked and grabbed the book, signed it. You mind if I get a picture? Didn't even smile for the camera. I'm like, okay. And then Paris Collins. Um, I got Paris Collins to sign my Blue Beetle. I have a picture with him. I have a picture with him. We'll just leave it at that. I met Steve Ditko once in the early 90s. He looked like Steve Ditko drawing of a balding older man. I agree. Jerry Ordway looked like one of... Jerry, go look at the picture. Jerry Ordway looks like one of his drawings. Jerry Ordway looks like one of his drawings. He's another one that's like that. Then I think just, that's just fantastic. Um, God, I had some stories to tell about Baltimore Con, and I'm kind of going blank. Uh, J.G. Jones. Met J.G. Jones when Matt Comercorder was going there to check on his commission, and we started talking. Uh, you know, J.G. Jones is, you know, seems like he's a real friendly guy and stuff. But I was talking about his 52 covers. Got some inside info there about how long it took him to do a cover. It was common knowledge. It was just sort of, you know, verifying of things. And then I said, I uh, mentioned about how I don't like Booster Gold, and he had a cover that actually I like the cover with Booster Gold. And he, he goes, you want to know his secret? He goes... I hate Booster Gold, too. J.G. Jones does not like Booster Gold. As I would go around the table checking out J.G. Jones' stuff and stuff like that, I got to see him do watercolors of the creature from the Black Lagoon. Walked by and saw Barry Kitson. Barry Kitson. And I sat there and I got to watch him. I, uh, he's He was inking, uh, what's this? Simon Bosley was fun to meet. Oh, that's awesome, man. I'd love to meet Simon Bosley. That's from Knights of Old. So Barry Kitson, I got to watch him, and it amazed me. I'm starting to see the, and Jared can probably chime in on this and stuff, but uh, when it comes to, like, my art and stuff like that, it's it's a hobby. Yeah, Golden Card Comics, yeah, we got another one that doesn't like Booster Gold. But, like, when it comes to my art and stuff, uh, my, mine's more of a hobby. Uh, I was, like, I was the kid in Art 4 that ended up teaching the Art 1 class. I mean, you know, there's a few things. I've had a little cartoons published here and there in local papers, nothing big. And that was like decades ago, but I always used the cheap stuff or what was available through a college class or schools. So after watching Barry Kitson inking this Atana, and he was talking to me also, I met Jim Starlin in Glasgow. He did a nice Cat Marvel sketch for me. He was very cool. Jim Starlin's a cool cat. Now, Lou, I don't know if you've seen my other videos about Heroes Con, but when Jim Starlin is at Heroes Con, that's my smoking buddy. We have never talked comics. We end up outside taking a smoke break around the same time, or at least he's there at the same time I am. I don't know how many time he take, you know, how many he takes, 
And the uh, first thing I ever asked him was like, how was your wife and how was your trip to uh, South Africa? And he just kind of looked at me. I said, I, 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 you're on my Facebook. I saw you said you took a trip to South Africa. And he's like, yeah, I'm down there quite a bit. His wife is from there. So there's like two or three years. And I have a picture on uh, Facebook or Twitter or something of him just sitting there smiling at me when I took the picture and stuff. We've never talked comics. We sit there and we smoke and we bullshit. But we've never hung out anywhere else. We've never talked anywhere else. And we've never talked comics. Jim Starlin is my smoking buddy at Heroes Con when he's there. I, it cracks me up. I'm probably not the only one. But a very kid. Yeah, Luke, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I may have a picture actually with him. It's, I don't even know. He doesn't even know my name. I mean, but I have pictures to prove this. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. But, uh, and he's a cool cat. He's a 60, 70s. Type. He kind of comes off like a 70s hippie, and you didn't want to mess with him back in the day, you know. Uh, but anyway. Uh, going on with Barry Kitson, it amazed me how he was inking this this intricate picture of Zatanna that he was doing, and he never reloaded his brush. So that the good art supplies apparently do make a difference. And as I was seeing how he was drawing, when, you, when I draw, I go into a little bit of a zone when I get there. So I'm wondering if I'm interrupting my zone by loading my pen back up. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know. My brush. Uh, oh, there's some other things. We had a fire drill. Uh, fire drill with the fire alarm went up on a Sunday. I have the video. I need to put it on Twitter or something But uh, I think we were there 20 minutes on Sunday and there's a grease fire in one of the restaurants down there um, And so we we went outside we got back in no big deal. Gosh, I know there's other things I put some cosplayers and stuff a good brush is the difference between frustration and pleasure All right, I'm making a mental note of that Jared um, We got here uh, anybody got any questions or anything? I think we're at the, we're a little bit over an hour. I think that's good for now. Um, I tell you what, uh, whenever I do these, I'm really enjoying these live shows. My computer being busted, it's right there. It's a little bit of blessing in the disguise. I like getting these out of the way. I get automatic comments. More and more people seem to watch them. Um, are you guys wanting, and you can put them in the comments or after this loads up, you can say it now and stuff, but... Would you guys be up for like maybe a movie Q&A like we did with Blade Runner and stuff? Maybe sci-fi, whatever. Uh, or, and would you guys be up for like a, sorry I got here late. I'll go back and watch the beginning. No problem, man. Uh, favorite comic favorite comic of the con? The favorite that I bought? Is that what you're saying? Uh, my favorite of the con. That is easy. Um, <laughs> let me find it here. It, it, it's not really that big of a deal on it. It was the... Oh, where are you at? There's the cult. It was the Finding the From Hell number six. Yeah. It's it's Finding the From Hell number six. These are around here in this area, okay? I mean, don't get me wrong. I found two or three, four. I'm going to have to check and stuff. But finding any uh, volume ones, you know, first print editions, first print editions of From Hell... Uh, I, actually, I actually love this series. You know, I can sit down and like reading it. I never thought I'd read it more than twice. Uh, and I don't, I can't stand the second issue, but it's exposition. It has to be done if you read From Hell. Uh, other than that, I actually love when I find things like this in the wild because they feel so unattainable. They have like lower print runs than mainstream comics. Uh, people jumped on it because of Alan Moore. You can only get them back in the day when they were coming out at shops. You couldn't find them on newsstands. First, From Hell was a frustrating book to collect in singles. Even I gave up. Exactly. Exactly. You get it. So my favorite book from the con was this one. You know what I'm saying? Um, but the favorite book that I came back with was that Epic Illustrated that uh, Charlton 66 sent back with me because that gives me that feeling of nostalgia. Curious if you ever used the Bud Plant catalog, Tim. I used to love buying random indie stuff and prints out of it. Haven't looked to see if it's still online. No, no, I've never used it. Um, I've always been wary of, to a certain extent, you know, of uh, getting online and looking at things like that. I've ordered books from Lone Star Comics, but they're, they're, I think they're called My Comic Shop now. And I've ordered on eBay um, because eBay is protected. If something happens, they rip me off, I get my money back. But, um, you know, actually, Charlton 66 and Matt Comic Quarter... I mean, back in the 80s, mail order. Oh, no, no, no. What I would do back then, okay, back in the 80s, uh, this is uh, Carl on Base 181. Back in the 80s, maybe it was, I don't know. But back in the 80s, what I did do is I would send a dollar 
to get these different catalogs to check out what they were. I would see these adverts. I read every inch of a comic, every inch of it, advertising, legalities, letter columns, everything. And I kept seeing these advertisements for order our catalog, order our catalog. My favorite con, my favorite finding any con has never been the most expensive book. Sometimes it's just the nostalgia of the books of a book of all the nostalgia the book evokes. Exactly, man. But um, going back, I would I probably had a Bud Plant catalog, but I would order around 85 and 86. I ordered 84, 85. I ordered Bud Plant catalog was great. I only ordered a few things of it, but I looked through them endlessly. Mile High Comics, Yellow Centerfold. Yep. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I would I've seen the dollar. I probably ordered, I'm serious, man, 20, 20 different uh, catalogs over the years by sending a dollar in just to go through them. And they were typed up and Xeroxed and stapled and stuff. Yes, do more live Q&A, Heller Mouse. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll do them. I'll do them. But so, yeah, I probably had a bud plant. And actually, it would be fantastic to find out that my sister or somebody still has a box with one of those stuck in there, man. Because they were folded over and they were stapled. And some had a yellow cover, red cover, green cover. I, I, I secretly started thinking some of these were the same company. American something was a common ad on back covers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I do remember that. I know exactly what you're talking about. I can see it in my head because I remember seeing the tick advertised because it had ninjas. Oh, man, what was that? Yeah. Now you're going to make me want to dig through my books and find these little catalogs and stuff that I ordered. Oh, man. There we go. Now now we're getting some comic book talk. We're getting some deep comic book talk. Comic Recorder 410. Hi, Tim. Had a great time, but now I'm trying to get my comic room in order. That's why I'm shooting this, man. I got to get this stuff put up, and I'm exhausted, man. Um, I hope you had a great haul. Can't wait to see your uh, comic haul there, comic quarter 410. Yeah, Matt was really cool, man. Tim, it's great to talk with you, mate, and everyone on the stream. It restores my faith in comics in a troubling time for the industry. All right, let's 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 touch on this, right? This isn't going to blow up the thing, right? Um, Louis, I know exactly what you're talking about. We've messaged each other a little bit back and forth about it and stuff, and I've mentioned it here on here out there and stuff. Uh, to have faith in the comic book collecting part of it, I ordered ElfQuest out of the back of Marvel Black and White magazine. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. But what I saw was the nastiness that's on Twitter. There's some of the videos that are out here and stuff. I'm not slamming any of that. Because when I get to these cons and stuff, it's the last thing on anybody's mind. I mean, it really is. Everybody, The people who are there are there to collect. It's not really divided you know, at all when you get out there. And when you go through the boxes, there's a certain company that nobody's buying their stuff like they used to. You go through these boxes and you can just move on. Nobody's touching their stuff. Nobody's bringing it up. Nobody's arguing about it. Um, it's like I've said before, the hobby is going to survive, you know. Elfcrest rules and stuff, right? But, uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's good to get offline and get away from some of that stuff and actually get your hands in there in the comics and get around other collectors and talk comics, you know. Uh, it is possible, and that's one of the good things about this last weekend. There was actually, like, zero of that to worry about, you know. Um, but And as far as the ElfQuest goes, I don't know what's going on. Dakin Howlett, uh, one of the older... Ah, oh, thanks, Lou. But when it comes to ElfQuest, they can how let um, back in the golden age of the comic book community. After live stream, I'm going to pull out some short boxes and have a look through them. You get it, Kyle. That's the best part of going to Denver Comic Con. Cool, that's Golden Car Comics, okay? But um, ElfQuest, uh, the, the resident ElfQuest guy, you know, in the early days of the comic book community when there was just a few of us, you know, and all that stuff like that, was they can how let. And I'd seen ElfQuest here and there and, you know, might have read one book when it was with Epic and stuff like that. But, man, I, I don't know if the fans are just finding each other. Thanks for being online. But that book is, that. I mean, I'm sure the book's always, it's, it's, the book has survived since the 70s. So I'm sure there's a cult following. But I don't know if it's Dark Horse. And it's nice to talk cool crazy from the J.G. Jones yourself to understand Booster, Gold, and Beetle. Yeah, Comic Quarter. You're just mad because, like, it's growing. But I have found another. Yes. <laughs> Booster ruined Beetle. I stand by that. You know, so. <laughs> but uh, that Elfquist book, I mean, it's really so cool to see Wendy Penny and, uh, oh, man, her husband can't think of his name and all that stuff it's really cool to see that book surviving i saw i've seen i've started seeing the omnibus collections through dark horse and stuff <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, so Elf Quest, man, it is really cool to see that, and and it's really cool to see people that absolutely love that book when they check it out. Richard Penny, thank you, Comic Order. I knew that. I knew that. You know, but uh, yeah, just just it's cool. I'm, I mean, I'm wanting. It, it's so weird. Uh, the library here has uh, these uh, really old. I think there might be some of the first trades of Elf Quest. You know, back you know, back in in the library. Uh, so I forgot about those. Yeah, I read those about three years ago. Some of the first ElfQuest books from the 70s were actually in a collected edition, uh, which, you know, that was really cool to find in a library. I might go back and see if they still have it. So, all right, guys, this thing keeps telling me I have a bad connection, so I'm assuming everybody can hear me, man. Uh, any more questions, guys? Anything else? Um, if if not, I'm going to get me something to drink and start trying to make my house look like something you can live in again. So... How good is the new Mr. Miracle comic? Hold on. Where is that? All right. I have issue one and two. Yeah, those Starblaze trades are tough to get and not cheap most of the time. ElfQuest Gallery, $30 an edition. Cool, man. All right. That's Jared Osborne, man, throwing out some indie knowledge, man. Okay. The Mr. Miracle books. Okay. Tom King. Uh, who's this artist? Well, I'm not sure who the artist is, right? Oh, you want to talk about the signatures? Okay, then let me back up. At cons, um, some of the some of the guys will uh, charge for signatures. Five dollars. Neil uh, Adams is up to thirty. Uh, you might want to look up about how Rob Liefeld treats people who wants him to sign anything Deadpool, specifically New Mutants number ninety-eight. Over the years, certain things have happened. I don't know all the ins and outs of why these guys might want to charge or anything and things like that. And a lot of people don't. They just don't. But they used to give free headshots. Oh, Neil is up to charging 50 now. Miracle's good, mate. I'm going to get to Mr. Miracle. But on the signatures, I just asked to be polite. And there, one of two things are going to happen. They don't charge to sign your book, and you can hang out and talk to them. Yeah, Golden Card Comics said he was thirty dollars at Denver. I think he was thirty. He was thirty dollars at Heroes Con too, but at Baltimore he was fifty. <clears throat> Comic Quarter four ten. So that's why he skipped him. And Frank Miller wanted a lot of money also. But uh, you know, some of these guys like Amanda. There's been little stories come out. Amanda Connor uh, put out online. I saw it that not. There's a guy specifically in Baltimore. Comic Quarter and Charlton sixty six know who he is. They were telling me about the guy before this happened, but. But there's people like, you know, these artists, you, some of these artists will give you a head sketch and give it to you and stuff. They go on eBay and they see that a signature and a head sketch, you're making money off of them, you know. Uh, and that, that bothers some of them. And then some guys are having hard times. They want to do it. I'm glad I'm not a signature collector. Cool, man. I love this you won. Right? I want to get to that. So, yeah, it, it's kind of polite to ask or they might already have a sign up. And then some guys will just tap this little fishbowl bucket beside of them. They want you to give to the Hero Initiative, you know, uh, uh, kind of helps, you know, comic book uh, creators who are having legal troubles and stuff and things like that. Um, the turd that I that I recorded in Trimpy's line a few years back, he does all the Northeastern cons. Yep, that's him. Yeah, comic quarters will go off on that guy in a heartbeat. Um, and then you have people who get there and they'll just put, drop a ton of books in front of a creator and some of them will sign them. I've seen Tim Truman do it, but they get some money, you know, 25, 50 bucks and stuff. And some people just set prices. Um, I don't know. I don't really get upset about it. It kind of sucks when somebody like Frank Miller wants a hundred to hundred fifty dollars for a signature. No big deal. And, and I'm not big on signatures, so it doesn't really bother me a little bit. Uh, Neil. Anyway, we'll just get off that. So yes, it's polite to ask. Now, you guys want to know what I, about Mr. Miracle? Chad Harden is big on the Hero Initiative. Nice. Laugh out loud. Okay. All right. <coughs> Stan Lee was only a hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Miracle, right? We have two issues of this out. Okay. And there's, I am a new God's nut. So I'm trying to be careful not to read into this. To me at first, it seems like it's a simple read. It also does this thing that I'm not liking if it's not used right is the two tone colors. They just use two colors, right? Not a big deal. Okay. Because it works in this. And uh, the thing with, if you read this, you know, every now and then there'll be this dark side is. And in the previews, I talked about him actually escape, being a super escape artist, can he escape death or something? So it's not, yeah, somebody mentioned CGC. That had a big to do with brain. With the people. I mean, 
thing to pay for their signature. But anyway, Mr. Miracle, I'll probably end up doing a review of this when a few more books come out because right now I'm guessing. But if you've seen Jacob's Ladder, I've played with Mr. Miracle. I'm also questioning if we are in reality or if Dark Side has gotten the anti-life equation. Okay, so I'm holding back on talking about it. The magic of this book is that it keeps you hooked. Tom King has presented us with a mystery and a little bit of something morbid that fits in with the new gods. Uh, very, I think we're reading something that's more existential than reality. Okay, uh, my kind of book. So yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's, I'm in for the long haul. And I never in my life, never in my life thought I would see even a, 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 a 60 seconds of Mr. Miracle Mania. You know, <laughs> so I'm sitting here like, wow, 2017. Rock on, man. All right, any more questions, guys? We're at an hour and 20 minutes. I read the first issue, Mr. Miracle. That was enough for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like I said, there's there's books I don't push on people. You know what I mean? I, um, the Final Crisis to me was... Grant Morrison's Final Crisis pissed a lot of people off that I knew personally when it came out. And they actually said... Matt looked at uh, Chad. I think it was Chad. Chad asked Matt. Chad, my friend Chad asked my friend Matt said, uh, what about Final Crisis? Should I get on this? And uh, Matthew looked at him and said, Tim said that uh, it's a cookie cutter. That book was made specifically for him. There was something I said that, like, this is a book that was cooker cut, cooker cook, cookie cutter made for me. And Chad said, fuck that. <laughs> so that was some deep DC, deep Kirby in there. I, I mean, I saw all sorts of things that Grant Morrison was pulling from the 70s and stuff like that. So whenever I do recommend books and people say they check them out and stuff, there's some anxiety there because, you know, Cosmic Odyssey has some cool new God stuff, my intro to them. I didn't like new God. I did not like Comic Cosmic Odyssey when it first came out. And then as I got older, I was like, hell yeah, now I got like five number ones and I love that book. Are you reading any more of the new DB Kirby S stuff? No, I'm not right now. Um... The bug is one that I have back ordered. Uh, when my Gmart comic book haul comes in, I should have four or five issues in there to check it out. Um, I really love that one. And what's strange is Cosmic Odyssey. Okay, guys, gotta go. Got a phone call. Let's work. I'll be back on later tonight, guys. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Later.